Hi everyone, it's Yvette Lee Blowitz from SparkGirl.com and welcome to the Spark Girl Talk Show Podcast. I'm super excited to be here with you today in this online audio space and with our very special guest who is Emily Silva, who is an author and a coach who helps women harness their bravery to bring their gifts to the world. Welcome, Emily. Hey, thank you so much for having me today. I'm super, super excited we're here today. You know, I'm a huge fan of your book, Find Your Glow, Feed Your Soul, a guide for cultivating a vibrant life of peace and purpose. Super, super grateful. And I love the cover, of course, and I love everything that's in here. But for all of our listeners who are joining us today and tuning in, right around the world. Can you tell them a little bit about who you are, what you do, and more about you in your own words? Yes, Um, thank you for the kind words about the book. Um, I'm Emily and I am an author, which is a dream come true of mine. Ever since I was nine years old, I wanted to be a writer and see my book in bookstores. And that dream came true four years ago, so that's exciting. I have, two books that you can find on bookshelves, Moonlight Gratitude and Find Your Glow, Feed Your Soul, and a third one coming out in September called Sunrise Gratitude. And I'm also a coach. I help women, like you said, harness their bravery to bring their gifts into the world. A lot of the things that my clients are doing are starting their own businesses, leaving the corporate world, taking a leap, and just letting go of some things that are really hard to let go of. I'm also married, and I live in San Diego with my husband. And we've just been working side by side at home during quarantine. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So congratulations on your soon to be third book. That's so, so exciting. Thank you. So when it comes to spirituality and soul and you're writing on this topic and you're helping women in regards to their soul, peace, purpose, What actually inspired you and started the journey, the whole soul journey for your own self? So I was working in corporate America, like so many of us, and I was doing very well, but something inside of me, my soul, um, was just telling me this isn't it. There's something more. There's something more. And I didn't want to lean into the discomfort because it was comfortable and secure to make money and take care of myself. But the longer that I did that, the more uncomfortable I was inside. And so I just started diving into self-help, trying to take care of the anxiety and the discomfort and the discontent on my own through just reading books. But really what I needed to do was listen to my inner voice that was telling me to leave my career which on the outside looking in was a dream career. I was in the wine industry and I was traveling all over the world, including Australia. And um, I love travel. And, you know, everyone that knew me thought this is her perfect job. But I was so upset and sad and just not happy with it. And I'd made the decision six years ago to quit my job. And from there, just things unfolded as they were supposed to. But I realized looking back that I was in my way because I was trying to control everything. Wow. So you had what looked like, say, to the outsiders, family, friends, the dream job, traveling the world. I love I love when you said you made it to Australia. But deep inside, you felt like there was something missing. It wasn't your calling there was more yeah and then when it came to the more how did you even find that more though like you were reading books at the time but then you mentioned you stopped to be quiet can you explain that a little bit more for the listeners who are tuning in this whole if they're doing as an example a job that they don't really feel is their calling and they're not feeling fulfilled, how can they like find more answers from within? That's a really good question. And it's actually one of the chapters in this book, Know Your Purpose. 
And one of the things that we have to do is we have to go back to our childhood and ask ourselves, what did we like to do? And one of the things, I mean, blaringly clear to me ever since I was a child and even as an adult was writing. And I loved writing, but I didn't know how to make a career out of it because it was just daunting. I mean, trying to get a book published is not easy. So I just started a blog and I found that release in writing on my blog and I didn't know who was reading. I just knew that it felt good for me to write. And the other thing I did, and I just recently, I told you this right before we started recording is I went to Bali and I did a writing, like I just took myself to Bali and wrote for a month. And through that writing, a lot of healing occurred. And it was stuff that was inside of me that I had stuffed down because I was busy and I was letting myself just go through the motions of living life. And what was coming up for me was I wanted a life of significance. I wanted to help people. And I realized that all the pain that I had gone through in my life, all the sadness, all the successes even led me to this point to a place where I could help people because I don't believe you can help people unless you've gone through something because at that point it's just platitudes telling them you know bumper sticker phrases but if you've actually gone through it you can offer empathy and understanding wow so the trip to bali really was a turning point for you and you just wrote just spent time by yourself with no one else as in partners, family, friends, just there writing, immersing yourself. In I traveled with a friend, but we had, we had separate um, places. So oh, she was yeah. there. Oh, She's great. also a writer and she um, was writing her own thing. But yes, a lot of solitude, a lot of alone time, a lot of walking. Um, yeah. And I mean, if you've been to Bali, it's not a metropolitan place. So yeah, no, I love Bali. I love to go there annually yeah. for the yoga retreats and things in Ubud. So for someone then who is just at home, however, they could just literally get a book, a blank pen, uh, like a book, a pen, and just start journaling thoughts, feelings. And you mentioned going back to their childhood to see what comes up for them, whether they had a dream as a child and whether they're aligned and doing that dream now as an adult. Would that be the key starting points for them trying to find their purpose? Yeah, so you ask yourself, what did I like to do? Because before the world takes a hold of us and tells us who we should be and how we should dress and what we should look like, we have this childlike innocence and wonder and that that soul is there and it's telling us what we like to do, whether it's roller skating or baking or cooking or writing, there's, there's a clue there. And then you take, you ask yourself, what do people come to me for all the time? So it might not be something that you're paid for, but it might be people are always coming to you and just telling you their life story, or people are always asking you to fix something. And these are things that you joyfully do because you're good at it. And in, in the book, I have a few questions you can ask yourself and journal about and like really taking the time to think about these answers. And I'm sure for some of your listeners, when I say, what did you like to do as a child? Something pops up immediately. Some of us may take a little bit more time where we have to like go back and look at pictures of ourselves when we were little and ask that little person, what did you want to do when you, when you grew up? Because as we grow older and we go to college or we get jobs, that innocence gets pushed down and our soul gets quieter and quieter and quieter. Yeah, I can truly resonate with this because a bit like you, I had the whole dream of writing a book because I saw Louise Hay on the Oprah Winfrey show when I was eight. And then my mum used to buy me a little golden gate book every Friday and write in there, Dear Yvette, Love Mum. And then every Friday we went to the library and immersed ourselves in books. So one of my dreams was always to write a book to help other people too, like you. But I too went down the corporate world, corporate path, doing all the things that supposedly 
should be done at a certain age. By this age, you do this, you do that, and then completely lost myself. And then it took like a total, the like my life going pear shape. When I had nothing at all, I asked the question, "What was it? What was my dream before I started living ev- like helping with everybody else's dream, or helping them to pursue their dream?" And it was that writing a book to help other. Fi- people to feel good from within. So I have done that. And it's kind of like, I felt like, I, did this happen for you, Emily? When you do make your childhood dream happen, it was like a big weight had lifted off my shoulders and it was like I had arrived. Like, you, it's done. I don't know, like, it's hard to explain, but I think for anyone, you might be able to resonate. But it's like, whoa. Oh, it was just such a big release. It was like that soul was like, you've arrived. You've made it now. Like you made it happen. It might have taken 30 odd years for this to happen, but it's sort of 32 years, but it eventually it's happened. So it just feels like now I'm not um, frustrated or struggling for that to happen. It's done. It's happened. It's, you know, I'm at peace from within. Yeah, actually, the day that I got the book deal for the first book, I was at a coffee shop outside and I got off the phone with the publisher and I started sobbing. Like the weight had lifted and I was like sobbing. Like I did, I probably look like somebody close to me had passed away. And this (laughs) man came up to me and he goes, Honey, are you okay? And I said, Yes, my dream just came true. And he said, congratulations and walked away. But I was just so overwhelmed with emotion because it was a 25. I mean, I started saying that when I was nine and I was 36 and the dream came true. So 25 years later, I received this gift from the universe. And it's just my, my, the thing is, you never know when your dream is going to come true. It might take 30 something years. Don't put that dream to bed, continue to work towards it. It's worth it. I mean, you said 32, I said 25 years. It's worth it. Yeah. I just love, you know, the whole sobbing part. I can resonate with that because when I got a message from uh, self-love mama actually was the first girl that bought my book on Amazon. And I didn't even know it was up on Amazon. When I got a message, I honestly was sobbing too. I was so emotional. It was such an emotional time. I kid you not. Um, So I can really resonate with that. So for now, one of the other sections I really, really love in here, it's actually in your introduction, but we talk about glow, find your glow. Now for some people that are tuning in, they might think glow means doing skincare routine, um, making your skin glow in that way but you talk about in your book what is my inner glow and you're talking about how it illuminates even in dark places you can bring warmth to situations that need understanding but can you share a little bit more about that so our listeners can learn more about what when you talk about find your glow feed your soul what does that mean in your world so yes, on, last year when the book came out, the there was a term glow up all over the internet and it was for your, your skin and, and your beauty and all these things you can do outwardly to glow up. And I thought it was so interesting that my book was called this and I was talking about all the things you can do inside to glow up. And so basically finding your glow is tapping into your soul, your inner light, because a lot of us, again, this can go back to childhood where we dim our lights, or even as an adult, we'll dim our lights to make other people comfortable, or even ourselves, because sometimes we are so um, ashamed of our power sometimes, or you know, we don't want to be too bright or too much for other people. So when we tap into our souls and we listen to what it is we're supposed to do, or we nourish ourselves where it's spending that time alone, doing the self-care, learning how to forgive, learning how to let go, we actually, we we emanate light. 
like it shows up in our eyes, it shows up in our cheeks and it has nothing to do with makeup or skincare. It's because we're feeling so lit up from the inside and then it's outward. And I believe that everything is energy. And when you change the energy in your body and you are taking care of yourself, you can take care of the people in your life better and you also show up differently and that's how you can glow. Wow. So it's really the inward that can create that outward glow. And I know what you mean. There are some people who just radiate, like you at the moment, you're radiating this glow, but it's not from um, makeup or cosmetic surgery and all of that jazz or wearing the latest, I don't know what, um, outfit by some designer. It's all inward. So what is your self-care rituals when it comes to finding your own glow? Meditation. So time in silence is key to me. Um, I can I can tend to be pretty anxious. And so if I don't spend time in silence and meditation, then I can, my brain can go out of control. Like I can just live up there. So meditation's number one. Um, every single day I drink a green smoothie because I believe that I need to feed myself correctly so my digestion works because your digestion is your second brain. And so I've been doing that for years. And um, I also love to journal and read every morning. So it's like meditation, journal, read, green smoothie. Those are like my non-negotiables. If I don't do those, I have a bad day. And wow. it's pretty simple. I love that. I love that. We're so similar in so many ways, <laughs> but I either will do a little bit of yoga or a walk, but I love to journal in the morning. I love the meditation and I love reading, even if it's only a couple of pages of a book that can just like I'm using my brain, I'm learning something new. I just, I just love that growth start to the day. But I love how you say also, I can resonate when you talk about you're a thinker and you can get caught up in thoughts. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners who are tuning in can resonate as well, where your mind's just busy thinking, 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 thinking. And a lot of go-getters can really have those thinking thoughts, but you've found obviously the meditation, which I found as well helps me to ground and to sort of connect back. My mind sort of feels like comes back into my body and my soul. And I feel more whole and connected for someone who's never meditated before. Like I always say, if you can breathe, you can meditate. Obviously, oh, yeah. you need your breath in order to meditate. But when you first started meditating, did you find it did take you some time to really get comfortable with the meditation practice? Like it did take some time to cultivate it to be a regular non-negotiable. So for someone starting out, would, we, would it be fair to say, in your opinion, it will just take some time to get that morning routine set up, but you will get there if you consistently show up each morning. Yes. So what I tell my clients who have never meditated before is to get an app. I like the Calm app. That's my favorite. There's also Headspace, 10% Happier, Inscape. Um, but to get an app and try one minute. Everybody can breathe for one minute. You, if you have an Apple watch, the Apple watch will time it for you. Um, and then go from there. And the other thing is a guided meditation is a great way to begin because then you're not, you're listening and you're not alone with your thoughts. And that helps you learn to breathe, to quiet the mind. And I do believe that using an app is a great way to start and you don't have to sit there for 20 minutes. Eventually you will. But if you sit down on your first meditation try and you think I have to do 20 minutes, you're going to fail. There's no have tos in meditation. So you're correct. As long as you can breathe, I tell people you can breathe in traffic. If you're in traffic, you can take 10 breaths and that's a meditation. 
Yeah, I love that. I love that you can take 10 breaths in traffic and that's your meditation. But I love the one minute because I must admit, I actually started out just how you explain that, that you explain that to your clients, but the total guided meditation, because if not, my mind's too, like when I first started meditation, it might be thinking about what do I need to get for dinner? What's happening here? You know, like it was so overactive and it's quieting down a lot, but I also did, I love the Calm app too. I was, as ever since Calm okay. app came out, I'm a fan of it. I still have it, but I also loved the minute. So I would do just a minute and sometimes I might even set my timer for five minutes and make sure I sit and listen to my breath and chill and tune in even if it's for five minutes before I leave in the morning so that's so amazing now when it comes to oh just I think there's a misconception though about meditation about how meditation means there's no thoughts in your brain meditation means that you're just observing the thoughts so just because you're sitting there breathing doesn't mean your thoughts are going to go away you can just say oh there's that thought and let it go so that's just, um, I don't want your listeners to think that I mean, you have to like, let all thoughts go. You just have to observe them and be there with your breath. And that counts as meditation. Yeah, actually, I'm glad you pointed that out because I still, whether it's one minute, five minutes guided meditation, thoughts still come up because I'm alive. So I remember <laughs> uh, there was a guru in India who said, why would you want your thoughts to stop? Because that would be like saying you want your heart to stop. He's like, whilst your brain is alive and whilst you're alive, you are always going to have thoughts. And I was like, yeah, okay. So that's right. So for all of our listeners, when you do meditate, you will have your thoughts coming up. You're going to let them rise, let them go. And you're just going to go with the flow. Exactly. I love that though. That's a good point. I'm glad Emily pointed that out. Otherwise you might think you've got to have this clear mind, which doesn't even exist. And I've heard Zen masters and spiritual people all talk about how they still have thoughts and um, all sorts of things. Now we, Emily, obviously are going through some really challenging times globally with COVID-19. Many countries have all come to a grinding halt shut down as you know international travel borders shut down shops shut down people have sadly lost their livelihoods their businesses their jobs um but really sadly their family members and friends and we've had so much hardship adversity struggle grief loss it's just been a mix of so many emotions how can someone who, as an example, may have lost their job or what they thought their business was going to be like, how can someone accept or work on this letting go part? Letting go to what, even if we think about like at this time of year, we should or someone might say at this time of year, I normally go on my family holiday and it's over to Greece or it's over to the Maldives or it's to Australia. How can they let go of what should normally be to what is now? Any tips or advice on the letting go part? Yeah, I think what gets us in trouble are our expectations. So I think that when we say things like, this time last year I was in and I catch myself doing that or I should have been doing this. I had a trip planned for this place for July of 2020. I mean, so many people had plans for 2020 that we were not going to do and it's hard. And so what we have to do is we have to give that sadness or that grief its place and, and say, I'm sad that that doesn't, that's not happening. But also we need to notice that there's an expectation there. We expect it to be somewhere. It's not going to happen. So an exercise I like to take my clients through is to pretend like you have a balloon in your hand and you take that expectation and you shove it in the balloon 
and then you fill the balloon up with air and you're holding onto the string and you watch the balloon rise with your expectation inside of it. And you hold on really, really tight and you're physically holding on because that's the, that's what we're feeling like inside. Like I just, I wanted to do this and I can't do this. I'm so upset. So you hold on, you hold on and you look at that balloon and you, you can close your eyes and do this. And then you release it and you take a deep breath and you feel that release and you watch that balloon go all the way up into the sky until it disappears with your expectation in it. And you can do that over and over when you're feeling that tension of, I was supposed to be going here or I was supposed to be doing this. Put it in the balloon, hold on tightly, tense your body, let your body tense because it's already tense. Take a deep breath and let it go and watch it go away. That's a simple exercise you can do to help you let go. Wow, I love that. I love that whole get the balloon, put that what you were supposed to be doing, but then you're going to let that go and it's going to fly away with the expectation and you're releasing it. And that's going to help find that inner peace and the letting go process. So that's and amazing. I also think it's important though to like let yourself be sad because it is, it is, it's terrible that some of these things are happening. And so it's okay to be sad, but it's the expectation that's keeping us tied to what we think should be happening. Because when we let go, what's supposed to be happening will come into our lives. Oh, I love that concept. When we let go, what should be happening comes into our lives. Yes. Yeah, so we can get in the way of what's supposed to come into our lives because we're holding on. For instance, before I quit my job, I was holding on, holding on, holding on. Like I'm just, I need to make one more paycheck. And I was miserable. And then the minute I quit my job, it's like the universe had its space to say, okay, here are all the things that you wanted. You know, maybe it took a year and a half for the book deal to come in, but if I would have held on to that job, I would not have had time to even write. Wow, that's so amazing, isn't it? Because it's such an amazing opportunity then, isn't it, for someone who does let go. And this is probably a good example myself, letting go of I can't travel internationally to the Maldives, so I had to return home in mid-March. And then I decided to let go of the knowing I can't travel international, just let go of it and focus on what I can do and which was to help others through the podcast show because I was like, wow, I can actually interview people, give tips to help the audience and community to help them during this really challenging times. But I think had I, like you said, just stuck to the... I can't do my travel shows. I can't do my travel shows and just not accepted that and just took myself in a downward spiral. Like I wouldn't be meeting as many amazing people as like yourself and many other authors and psychologists and amazing people globally and sharing and helping people. So that is amazing. Now tell me when it comes to your own nourishment and exercise because you have a section in here about nourishment and exercise and you have talked a bit about your green smoothie being a non-negotiable but what does your exercise look for you look like for you well during covid <laughs> it was difficult to get a, a routine down because a lot of, I live by the ocean. So a lot of the places that I usually would run were shut down. So usually I like to lift weights and run and do yoga. The gyms have just reopened so I can do that again. But during COVID, I set myself a running goal and I was just running in the streets, which is something that I don't usually do because I don't want to get run over by a car, but I had to. <laughs> Plus nobody was really driving during COVID. So, um, yeah. So for two months, I just set, um, running goals and, uh, my, my, my prize for myself was to buy new running shoes if I met my goal. So that's how I kept active during COVID. And now I'm just back to my normal routine of lifting weights, yoga and running. Oh, wow. I love that. I love how you set yourself a goal during COVID-19. A lot of women couldn't 
go and have their usual beauty rituals or their eyes waxed or their facials or even their cosmetic works or whatever it might be. You talk about here embodying uh, embody love, but you also talk about acceptance. Now, one of the challenges a lot of women talked about was even being on Zoom and seeing themselves back, you know, through the Zoom um, talks there on video and also accepting that they couldn't get their usual beauty outward mm -hmm. treatments that made them inwardly feel good. When it comes to acceptance and self-acceptance, we have so many, uh, I guess, photos now on Instagram and there's so much content out there and everybody is a walking billboard of themselves or promoting themselves or they're on a journey to be a public figure or a model or a blogger or an Instagrammer, or they just have a business and they are told they have to put themselves out there now. If they have a business, even the spa owners have to start talking in front of camera. They have to post photos of themselves and they have to be on social. But for someone who doesn't really like looking at themselves in a photo, doing a live, doing Zoom, or feels pressured that maybe someone else in their industry is more popular than them, maybe looks more prettier than them. How do you have any tips to help them with self acceptance? That's a big one. Um, you know, I help women start their own businesses and part of it is branding photography and getting on Instagram lives and just the biggest thing I agree with you is getting on the video and seeing themselves and then having that negative self-talk where they're picking themselves apart and no one's actually probably seeing those things, but we see what we don't like about ourselves. So one of the things that I have my clients do, and I've had to do this too, is just make a video every single day. You don't have to post it, but just get used to you seeing yourself on video because you are who you are. You're beautiful just the way that you are. And whether or not it's COVID or not, and you can't get your eyebrows waxed or whatever, like that's, that's what you were born to look like. And so if you get used to seeing yourself and you make those videos every single day, they can just be one minute videos and you watch them back. But the key is you have to say loving things to yourself when you're watching it. So if you catch yourself saying like, I don't like when my lips do that, or I don't like the way that whatever, you have to stop and reframe it and say, you have a beautiful mouth. Your teeth look healthy. Just whatever it is that you're picking apart, stop yourself. Notice that you're saying that. That's something that you have to work on. That's something that inside of you, you're judging yourself about. And we can change the judgments about ourselves if we reframe them, but we have to catch them and retrain our brain to think differently. And with practice, the more we stop the thought and reframe it, the easier it'll be to say, I love you, you're beautiful. I love your mouth, I love your eyes. Your eyebrows look fuzzy today, that's so cute. <laughs> I love that, your eyebrows look fuzzy today, but that's so cute, I love <laughs> you. That is so amazing, I love those words of wisdom. And I um, totally, for any, person out there, woman, guy, girl, you can, boy, you can really, I love how you say do it daily. Even if you don't have to post it, it's the getting used to seeing yourself on camera or the getting used to speaking on camera, which sometimes isn't everyone's norm. Um, because once upon a time that was really for, you know, the TV reporters or the presenters or the radio announcers or the celebrities. Um, and many businesses, business women never thought in a million years, even working in a spa, they would ever have to get on camera and talk to their clients on video um, before it was just booking them in to come and they would put this ad in the yellow pages or on a banner or send out an email or a newsletter. So I love how you're helping women also to harness 
that and to be able to show up and overcome those self-doubts or insecurities. That is so amazing. Another exercise they can do is if there's something that's really hard for them to make a column on the left-hand side of a piece of paper, the things that they don't like about themselves, like just be honest, say what you don't like, be honest with yourself. And then on the right-hand side, an empowering thought about that body part or that, that thing that you don't like about yourself and practice reframing that. So when you have it written down, you can see how mean you are being to yourself and how you deserve love and acceptance and you are beautiful. And the more that you get that out of your head, the easier it is to, to, to fix it and look yourself in the eye and say, okay, I know that I feel this way about myself and that's not fair. So I'm gonna try and say this instead. Yeah. And then let yourself practice that and be, give yourself grace because it's going to take time. Wow. Give yourself grace because it's going to take time. Love, 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 love that. And I agree because I know if I don't practice my own self-care rituals of walking, eating healthy, journaling, meditation, yoga, and I'm not at my healthiest, you honestly, like you do feel like shit and it's mm -hmm. human nature to, you know, you really like size yourself up and say, what's going on here? I've let myself go. And, but acknowledging that you have the power to change it and do the self-care ritual so you can feel good again. But I like how you said staring yourself in the eyes and looking at yourself and then being kind versus being mean. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because when people are mean to us directly, we get all upset. And then yet when we can be mean to our own self, we're like accepting. And it's like, hang on a minute. Yeah. So we should no longer accept being mean to ourselves or mean to others, um, period. So that's amazing. Now tell me, when you're um, not in COVID-19 and in lockdown and writing your books and everything like this, you talk about an area of prioritize joy. This has been very challenging and difficult for so many people at the moment in lockdown. They're feeling like, okay, they normally go out for dinner with their friends and have dinner and drinks or they gather as a family or they go to nightclubs for our younger folks joining in, prioritizing joy. How can someone prioritize joy, even if they're stuck at home in lockdown, or maybe they're restricted to what they can do? Is it possible they could still find joy in the smallest things in life? Yes, yeah, so I definitely have had a problem with this during COVID, especially in the beginning, because I love traveling and just the borders being closed was devastating to me. Um, so one of the things we can do in COVID, in lockdown, or just any, any time in our lives is joy is available to us at any moment. We do not have to go experience it. We do not have to be in a special place. We don't have to be in the Maldives or Bali mm. or the beach. We could be in our house because all of us have a joyful memory that we can tap into. And so one of the things that I did while, you know, we were really in lockdown and we couldn't even like really leave the house was I would look at travel videos with, or travel pictures with the intention of prioritizing joy and saying, well, that was a really good memory. And the other one that I did was one of my most joyful memories is when I saw my husband, when I was walking down the aisle at our wedding. And that is a memory that I can tap into whenever I want to feel an overwhelming sense of joy. Or the first time I met my nieces and nephews after they were born, I can remember that time. And when I'm having a really hard day and there's no joy available, or I think there's no joy available, yeah. I can go back to those memories and remember that it lives inside of me. It has nothing to do with what I'm doing that day. And then I can remember these things. I can let my body fill up with that feeling 
breathe into that and then take that into the rest of my day. Wow. I love that. I love that. That's really, really beautiful. So you're tapping into your joy based off the memories. And when you're thinking of those memories, it's bringing up those emotions, which we can really harness, like take into the day. So, and everybody has those beautiful memories. Like you said, whether it's your wedding day, meeting your nieces, that holiday and it's all there to tap into well and then you take it you take it a step further because once you have that joy in your you can feel it then you ask yourself okay what is going right right now because you still have to live in the present moment so there are things like during covid i have food in the refrigerator i'm healthy we have in America, we had no toilet paper. So if we had toilet paper in the bathroom, that was something that was going right. Like simple pleasures. You know, I had my green smoothie today. I was able to get spinach at the store. Those things started to become very important because you didn't know if you were going to go to the store and find the things that you needed. Cause sometimes the produce section was completely wiped out. And so after you access that joyful memory, you go into the present moment and you say, okay, what is working right now wow go into the present moment and ask what is working right now and i agree i was so grateful when i could get like my takeaway coffee because they had a drive through in australia and we were allowed we were allowed in australia to go through the drive through to get coffee they kept the coffee shops open like we were so lucky we were so it was just so amazing that is so amazing now when it comes to gratitude, you are huge on gratitude, which I totally am too. I, I just practice it all day, all night. Um, it just fills my own cup up and makes me feel so good. But you talk about in your book, daily gratitude. Now for someone who isn't practicing gratitude, hasn't started the gratitude attitude way of life yet, What are some things they can do to help cultivate their own daily life of gratitude too? I mean, the the easiest thing to do is to write down three things you're grateful for every single day. I think that's been the practice that's been taught for years. I like to take it a little bit further by saying what you're grateful for and then why. So you go deeper into For instance, I'm grateful that I was able to get takeaway coffee. And you can go deeper. You can say, because it's one of the only things that's open, it's a sense of freedom and it's a treat to myself. And you can, I mean, I can feel that myself because I just got some takeaway coffee today and I didn't have to come home and make it. And it felt amazing to treat myself to something so simple. And when you can say what you're grateful for and why, you feel it deeper as opposed to just writing out a sentence. And another thing is every time something good happens, whether it's little or really big, stopping to say thank you. So, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I started practicing gratitude on the regular was I live in California and we have California poppies everywhere and they're very, very bright orange. And I've lived here my entire life and I really never noticed them. But when I started practicing gratitude, I remember seeing them and just thinking, oh my goodness, those are so orange and that's so beautiful and bright. And it makes my day so happy. And I felt so grateful with the simplest thing or even like the color of grass after the the winter, I'm just like, it's so green. (laughs) So I think that the more you practice gratitude and you stop and allow yourself to say, wow, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for providing that. Or I'm so grateful that you're in my life or I'm grateful Yvette for this opportunity to talk to you that then you bring more things into your life to be grateful for. Cause then you just start looking for it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I actually can resonate and I'm sure everyone who's tuning in, who is already practicing gratitude though, for those who aren't yet, I agree. It's, being grateful when even seeing the sunrise, like I wrote this just little quote, um, I'm living the good life, my eyes are open um, and I'm watching the sunrise because 
it's so like fulfilling the smallest things. Like you said, it doesn't have to come. People think they need like a, a house to be happy or they need this job to be happy or they need a certain amount of followers to be happy. But they can be happy just simply by practicing the gratitude. Like you said, what are you grateful for and the why? And that can bring so much joy, can't it? And fulfillment and just the knowing that, wow, this life is just amazing, a miracle. I think on the days where I feel my saddest or lowest are the days that I'm not practicing gratitude and I'm not meditating. So if I feel really upset, I usually have to say, hmm, I haven't been grateful for one thing today what's going well right now. And it's just going back to like the prioritizing joy. What's going well right now. Maybe something terrible is happening, but there is something that's going okay. There's always one thing that we can, and then you focus on that because what's going on in the world is out of our control. We can't fix it. It's going to, it might go on for a very long time, but there are things that we can find joy in, be grateful for like takeaway coffee, like good conversation and if that's what we have to keep us going for the next couple months, that's okay. And I was like, and we're grateful for your book because this book, I'm super grateful for it. It's actually my little coffee shop book now, but Find Your Glow, Feed Your Soul. This is being sold in Australia at the majors, but in particular at Target's, Big W, um, so many stores. And I'm super grateful because when I found your book talking about being grateful, it was just so beautiful, like the cover and the content and what was in there. And I felt like, oh, I've got to share this because this could help other people who are stuck at home. Their purpose might be tipped upside down or their life, or they might be feeling at their lowest point yeah. in their entire life and they might just not feel well or they just feel stuck in a rut or confused or frustrated or they've lost their glow. And I was like, wow, I need to share this book. So that's why it's so amazing, Emily, I get to share you today because even being able to meet, for me to read a couple of pages a day and learn and practice and I just truly believe we all have gifts to give um, lessons to share, opportunities to grow, and just so much like even cultivating your worthiness right about now, beginning by recalling the moments when you were made to feel less than, not enough, and unworthy. That section in itself can really help our listeners because losing our jobs isn't Oh, yeah. Doesn't make us feel good. Um, even though it, we know it's not our fault because it's COVID 19, it's still very devastating on everything. Now, you talk a lot about soul. People talk a lot about this ego, this whole ego thing, ego versus soul. But I noticed in your book, you talk more about just connecting to the soul, being observant of your thoughts. Um, for someone who wants to cultivate another positive mindset, you also talk about how you can share, get rid of sort of the negative energy that's surrounding you and you can work on cultivating a positive mindset. So would you say when people refer to ego, is it really that second voice or is it just our thoughts, ego thoughts? Like we're all were born to win. We were all born to like, we were brought up, especially in Australia, to be number one. We have to be number one. We've got to win. We need, you know, competition. It was bred in us, I think, as children. We had to come first in school sports. We had to win the Estedford. We had to win that book club thing, like win, win, win. So when we're not feeling like we're not winning at the moment, 
we can still cultivate though, can't we, a positive mindset versus the negative mindset. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think the winning, the win, win, win is all based in fear. It's the fear of loss. And so the ego wants to protect us from the pain of loss. And the soul, the, the, our, our subconscious is like, it's okay. You're going to lose. Life is about loss because that's where the lesson and, and the growth and the greater joy lives because we cannot know joy if we don't know loss and pain. And so our ego is afraid to lose, is afraid to have that pain. And so it gets in the way of the soulful living, which is where the loss and the pain, but also the joy and the amazing awe and wonder that life has for us. That's where we can have it all. And so we can, we need both of them. But if we only serve one of the masters, we're going to create that tension in our life. Yeah. Wow. I love that. That's a really good description because I'm seeing on social media, even playing out where women now will openly talk about how their business has stopped. Um, and the reason being they couldn't have in events. Yes. But they're surrendering and they're telling everyone why they're closing the business mm -hmm. and which takes a lot of bravery to sort of accept it and talk about it. And um, one of the brands in particular was the girl boss rallies and the founder of that has stepped down and not doing that. And they've lost five people from that business, but it takes a lot of courage too, doesn't it? To, openly talk about the pain and the loss because we could just pretend like everything's going really well my my business is so amazing like COVID-19 no it really hasn't affected me da, 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 and put on this front and put on a mask and just try and pretend everything's going so well would you agree it would be better if someone is struggling out there or maybe not doing so well, whether they talk to their family or friends initially or even journal it, that they get really clear on what acceptance. You talked about this a little bit earlier. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to feel it. We, but we have to spend time feeling it instead of trying to push away like, yeah. Yeah, I think I think that when something like that happens, which is happening all over, yes, it's the sadness is opening us. It's a crack to let the light through, and so when we can let go of the thing that we held on so dearly, that's not going to work anymore. We now have open hands, and they're not going to stay empty for very long. So if we can feel that pain and let it course through us and process it and grieve the loss of a business, because mm -hmm. it is, it's grieving. It's something that you built and it's, it's painful, but now your arms are open, your hands are open and you're a creator. Imagine what's next because you went through that pain and now you can help somebody else because your pain is going to bring you joy. There's always joy when pain is present. So feel it, grieve it, be sad, talk to, get some help, talk to friends and family. Maybe don't even tell social media right now, yes. just process it. And I always say, speak from the scar, not from the wound. So process it and then be brave and say, my business didn't work out. I don't know where I'm going but I know everything's going to be okay and I'm having a hard time and that's okay. Wow. Speak from the scar, not from the wound, process it first and then you can open up and tell others. I really love that because I just recently did that myself. Even when my mum fell critically ill and her lungs weren't functioning. She had to go on an oxygen machine, had a seizure, went into a coma. Initially, I wasn't ready like that day, of course, or the next day or even the next few days to just get on live and tell 
the followers or Spirit Girl podcast show listeners or travel show what was happening, I first was able to write it and share that in a story and then over time verbalise it. But you're right, I had to process it first and then I was able to talk openly about it. Now, Emily, I could talk to you forever, like all day. That's why I think I called it a Spirit Girl talk show because <laughs> literally it literally is a talk show. We've been nearly talking for an hour and I know sometimes my podcasts go well beyond an hour. They're like a podcast day. It should be a <laughs> podcast day show, the whole day show of one particular book or the topic. What you're doing is incredible. You must love seeing when your clients literally transform the way they feel from within. You must love seeing them go for it and have this amazing idea and passion, but then helping them realize that they can do it and overcoming insecurity, self-doubt. Like, how does that make you feel? I mean, I know so much about your book makes you feel amazing when you get your book reviews or people like myself asking you, can we share it? Can we share it? But in your own words, you are helping women transform the way they feel from within and becoming brave. Like when you compare, when you sit here now and compare your old self corporate to like how you feel now. So comparing how you felt as the corporate doing this job everyone thought was like shit hot and amazing to the now. How does that make you feel changing, helping change these so many people's lives globally? I think first of all, my clients change their own lives. And so I'm just grateful that I get to be part of their journey because I can give tools and I can listen and I can ask the right questions but they have to do all the hard work. So I am just, the way it makes me feel is humbled and really, really grateful that I get to be part of a little part of their stories because they continue to go off and do amazing things on their own. And if I can just spark something inside of them and help them reignite their love for themselves or find their passion, then I consider it a job well done and just, can't believe that I get to do this with my life because what I was doing before was really cool, but this is where my soul feels at home and totally lit up. Wow. So you wake up every day now feeling energized and excited and just like so happy in spirit just because you're doing what you love. I'm in, yes, I'm definitely living my purpose for sure. Oh, that is so amazing. And this book here for everyone who's tuning in, Find Your Glow, Feed Your Soul by Emily Silva. I kid you not, this can be even a starting point for finding your own purpose and cultivating your own inner peace, self-love, your glow. There is so much information in here, so much opportunity we haven't even scraped, like we've just scraped a little bit of the surface, but I love the worry less, examine your thoughts, yield to the universe, zero in on what you want, harness your braveries in there, identify your intentions, journaling, let go, meditation, forgiveness, give back, celebrate your wins, own your power, quiet judgments, restore your energy, stillness in the art of solitude. And I could keep going on and on and on and on and on. But you can see if you want to start your spiritual journey, this is one of my favorite books, a go-to part of the Spirit Girl Book Club now. And you can get this at department stores here in Australia online. Emily, yep. this is sold pretty much everywhere I've seen. If they just even Google it, I'll put a link into the podcast caption so you can link to it to buy um but even so if all you're doing now is listening in how can people stay in contact with you moving forward after this podcast show my instagram is souls adventures s-o-u-l-s-a-d-v-e-n-t-u-r-s of souls adventures i'm on there 
quite a bit. And then also my my website soulsadventures.com it has my blog it has all the information on how to work with me um and also information on my books because my next book is coming out in september so there is um pre-order bonuses up so if you want to pre-order the new book sunrise gratitude you can download a bunch of i have a guided meditation a morning journal workbook a sneak peek into the book and then i'm going to have a video series coming out in july yeah, I'm so excited. We'll have to have you back on the show again when Sunrise Gratitude starts. But I'm super excited. You've got 365, 365 morning meditations for joyful days all year long. This yes. is just amazing. And I love all of the inclusion included things you're doing as well. But obviously these meditations it's going to be a journey, isn't it? When you go on these meditations for different things relating to some of like quite a lot we've talked about in here also in a glow, love, peace, purpose. Yeah. So in my first book, Moonlight Gratitude, it was to help you calm your mind and get ready to sleep and just really bring some tranquility into your life. With Sunrise Gratitude, it's supposed to help you activate your day, bring joy and purpose. So it's more of like an upbeat meditation. I did want to read one meditation. Yes, They're short. Yes. From if we could, gratitude. that would be amazing. And this one I thought I'd read about letting go since we're going through what we're going through. So yes. it's from Moonlight Gratitude. To trust is to let go and know that everything is working out just the way it needs to be. This can be a scary concept, especially when the urge to control is strong. The key is to release your attachment to the outcome and have faith that all the work you have been doing will pay off. Sometimes the answers are not what we would like to hear, but they only bring us closer to where we need to be. Oh, wow, that is so beautiful. They only bring us closer of where we need to be. Mm -hmm. That's so gorgeous. And that's from your book, That's the Morning Gratitude. gratitude. Moonlight gratitude. Moonlight gratitude. This is in Australia as well. Yes, moonlight gratitude. That's gorgeous. And then we're going to have the sunrise gratitude. This is so yep. exciting. I'm super, <laughs> super excited. Well, thank you so much, Emily Silver, for sharing all of your words of wisdom. It's just truly remarkable. I love how you're helping women. Though, even for our guy listeners, you can literally use this. This is Unisex's book, and all my of the husband other. My husband has it on his bedside. Ah, oh, there. Oh, my goodness. Your husband is such a lucky, lucky guy to have you. Such a beautiful soul, helping so many people. And this is really um, such a gift, a light worker gift during these challenging pandemic times and crisis. And this is a gift to all of you, this learning about this book and your words of wisdom's teachings too. So we will say officially goodbye on the Spirit Girl Talk Show podcast. I really hope you loved listening into today's podcast show and that you feel inspired now to find your glow and feed your soul. So I would love for you to leave a five-star rating and review and to subscribe, plus tell someone you love to. I will see you at spartitgirl.com, Spirit Girl anywhere on Instagram or any social media app. Super grateful you tuned in today and super grateful that you're part of our Spirit Girl podcast community globally. Take care. Love you all. Talk on the next podcast show.